Hello everybody and welcome to our second part, our first chapter in History of Costume. And we're going to be talking about Egyptian dress as well as Crete. So we're going to talk about ancient Egyptian first. The main highlights, just generally speaking, Egyptian dress was scantier and lighter, obviously because of the hot, dry climate. Now one thing that's interesting here is that unlike other ancient civilizations, we actually have more examples of Egyptian items. And the reason being is that not only was it hot, but it was dry and it helped preserve the items. In addition, they really focused and really paid a lot strong attention to preserving, you know, mummification, preserving the dead, and they would put items and it made it really good specimens to study when their tombs have been dug up. So it really, the climate helped preserve it and their standards for mummification help preserve a lot of the items. So generally speaking, a couple things that you need to know, lower classes and slaves lit wore little to no clothing. Very simple dress, if anything, and we'll talk about the terms, basically a loincloth around their waist and that's it. But basically, it wasn't uncommon to see them naked. Slaves wore little to no clothing. Same thing with the young children. They did use clothes to separate class distinctions, so that's really big in ancient Egyptian culture. Royalty, so the key, they were called pharaohs, and they did use gold crowns. They would wear animal skins and they would wear jewelry, elaborate headpieces. Lower class obviously had very minimal to no clothing and very little accessories. Um, the information that we do have, a lot of statuette wall paintings and we do have, again, some preserved items thanks to, again, the, the dry, dry climate as well as their standards of preserving. So the main item, and we do look at three main time frames. So Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and New Kingdom. And the main garment for Old Kingdom, this is before 2130 BC is the shanti. So it's a piece of woven material used as a long cloth and secured by a belt um, or tied like a sarong. So that's basically almost like a loin cloth. So kings, dignitaries pleated and stiffened and they would embroider their shanties. Those lower class, very plain, simple. It's just a rectangular piece of fabric. Those that were higher class would actually pleat and stiffen. So that's why you do see in the some of the hieroglyphics, some of the paintings and statues more ornate. Anytime you see that pleating, the embroideries, that means they were higher class. Middle Kingdom is around 1600 uh, BC. Dress was almost the same, but you started using more nicer draped, slightly nicer, they started using cotton and nicer draped clothing. Still wore the shanty. Now the New Kingdom brought a new style. It did change the way they wore clothes, which is, we're talking about like around 1420 BC. Pharaoh started wearing these long fringe tunics and they're called calceres. And it's semi-transparent, so you can kind of see it. And then it would allow you to see the loincloth underneath. It's transparent. And women would wear really, would wear like really tight under the bust and secure with shoulder straps. So they'd have like these long skirts and they would use a really wide cape or jeweled collar. They would have the chest exposed. They weren't embarrassed by that. This is so you can get an idea, a main comparison, the shanti, which is the loincloth for Old Kingdom, the calaceras made out of linen typically, both items typically worn by, uh, made out of linen. And as you can see, you can tell the difference between someone who is of higher, higher stature. You can see this, this calaceras and again, semi-transparent. Okay, this is another example. You'll see this a lot and semi-transparent. You could see the collar, so that's a calceris. And the tight uh, long skirt with, with the straps, there it is, Cleopatra. Now, um, most of what is known for Egyptian fashion is due to burial procedures. They were really strict on those and linen was pretty much an exclusive textile with Egyptians since basically that's what they were able to grow uh, in their area. And the nicer drapes, especially the calaceris, they were using the best linen. So the it was less stiff, it had better drape. That was used for burial cloths as well as for priests, those that were had stature in the in the society. They were really big on hygiene. They really did have high standards. So linen was washable, so they made sure they washed their clothes. Men and some women would shave their heads. They would wear headdresses of square that were square, striped uh, material encircling the temples. A, a lot of them did wear wigs as well. So ceremonial wigs were of natural hair um, and others were made of flax or plant fiber. Children were naked until six years of age and then in which case they would wear the shanty, so very basic type of clothing. But yeah, until they were six, they were also naked. In terms of hair, young princesses would not save, I'm so sorry, there's missing an H, shave their head, not her. Um, older did wear hair, but the young princesses did shave their head or they would frizz or wave their hair. Pharaohs, again, the ruler leader used 
crowns of gold. They called gold nub or noob because Nubia is where they um, found a lot of gold. Uh, warriors would wear helmets, so that's another type of headdress. And the term for headdress that was worn by nobility is cat, but K-H-A-T. And simpler than the nemes or nemes uh, headdress, that's another type of headdress that they would wear. It did not have pleats or stripes, so the, straight, the pleated or striped hat that I mentioned um, is, na um, is named nemes and hung down open in the back rather than being tied together. So this is another type of headdress. So the two main ones, nemes and cap. And we definitely see it in a lot of the sculptures, which is great, uh, great examples to see. Uh, they're also known for their makeup, elite men and women. So higher, higher in the social class, elite men and women enhance their appearance with several cosmetics. Definitely was big on oils and perfumes. They would use perfumes on their wigs. They really liked eye and facial paint. They actually used a mineral paint. They liked a mineral pigments. They they loved using coal and outlining their eyes. They're known for eyeliner uh, using coal, so really black. When putting on makeup, they use a mirror, a reflective surface as we do today. And very interesting hieroglyphics to see them putting on makeup and ma fixing the makeup and putting perfumes on their wigs. There's several hieroglyphics on that, so it's fascinating. So here you can see several interpretations and some things have, some tunics have fringe, some have more pleats, some are more plain. So that way you can tell what, what social structure, social class they are. They're really big on collars, so please, if you love beading and jewelry, um, take a look at their collars, because it's amazing. You can get some, I've gotten such amazing ideas for the necklines of dresses and to make a bib or statement necklaces out of the ancient Egyptian patterns, because they're, they're amazing. So please take a look at those. Look at that one, that's amazing. Love it. So take a look at these. For footwear, uh, barefoot most of the time, but some did wear sandals, okay? And this is an actual pair of sandals, and so is this. So I really want to show you because these are actual Egyptian sandals at a museum, so it's pretty neat um, to see. So as you can see, wrapping, kilt apparel, and again, they would expose their chest. They weren't embarrassed by that at all. And if you were a slave, you were either naked or a very simple loincloth. So again, by just looking at this, here you can tell this person is higher stat social stature, the girl, and the slave, you can see working. You can see by what's he, what they're wearing. So you don't even have to have a picture of them doing manual labor. If you can just look at what they're wearing, you can see who's of higher social status and who's lower. So those are the main ones, and I can look at these pictures forever, but these are some movies if you want to look really good costumes for Egyptian is Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. So since we still are under quarantine, I recommend you take a look at that. The hair, the makeup, the wigs, and the clothing very well. The costumes did a really good job. And the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. Also, be wonderful costumes uh, for the Egyptian time. So take a look at that. It's fascinating, and they did such a good job with the with the costumes. So take a look at those. And you can see modern interpretations all the time. A lot with the black and gold, with the metallics, and you see a lot of those influences. So this, for example, is Chanel. Um, so you'll see a lot of high-end designers showing their influence. Now, the last thing for the first chapter is looking at the Crete culture, which we're looking at around 1400 BC. And Crete is an area in Greece, and basically Crete was inhabited before the 6th millennium, right? Before the 6th millennium BC. They're very original in their way of dress. So it's the first civilization to build a palace, so I thought that was really interesting um, for you to know. And this is one of the most famous fresco. So basically, because this is a Minoan site, so the, the, the Minoans, when you can see the bull leaping, uh, which was a sport, it's a ritual, very famous. And look at the colors, because these colors are very representative of what we see in that, in that ancient culture. So Crete seemed uh, to be inhabited before the 6th millennium BC, but a wave of immigrants from the Cyclades, uh, Cyclades introduced navigation. And what it, that did was that in, increased trade, right, with e Egypt and Asia Minor. And what you could see is you start seeing this influence. But what's interesting is before you see that Asian uh, culture influence, so we're talking about 2000 years BC, they developed this kind of really original way of dress that's different. I mean, you can see some similarities to ancient Egyptian, but it's it's different and different from a Greek looks. The most interesting period, the one you need to know about, because this is the one that's most distinctive, is the period between 1750 and 1400 BC. Uh, the place of Knossos uh, was constructed. You can see a lot of frescoes, painted pots. That's how we have the evidence of this and statues that show dress. What it basically showed us is really a lot of luxury. They loved refinement. They loved luxury. Males did have loincloths, and they sh they showed their bare chests. And females had these really elaborate, a long series of flounces, really super tight at the waist, and a completely exposed chest. 
So you might have seen some of these if you study history, but look, the, these are the flounces. So these are the tiers on the skirt, super tight on that waist and then exposed chest. So their breasts were just exposed and they would have like a little shrug covering the shoulders and the arms, which is interesting because that was a sign of modesty is to cover the shoulders, but not the chest. They were like totally out there and very colorful. They're known for using a lot of color. Um, they would wear belts too, and men would wear some belts, and they would have like these little metal plaques, these little metal studs. Men were also known, were opted to have the small waist. So they would wear these belts really early and super tight to kind of sh help shape the waist, almost like think of it as like a semi-corset, I guess. Um, but it, it was designed to, again, really shape that waist. Metals, they love jewelry. They love gold, silver, and bronze. Men didn't really wear head coverings. Women had uh, had more elaborate dress and they had the first ones to wear the hat. So they wore hats before the men did. Um, in terms of colors, they're really known for bright colors. So just think about the colors you just saw on the pe previous slides. They are a little bit more muted, obviously because of time, but bright colors, red, yellow, blue, and purple. You could see those on the frescoes. You can clearly tell they were fond of jewelry, lots of rings, bracelets, collars, hairpins. And those that were wealthy, they would wear like different necklaces with different stones and crystals and rocks. Um, they even use pearls. A lot of people don't know that they use pearls. And interesting with them, they would actually cut and shape the cloth. So less pinning and more of cutting and shaping up to the body, which is gonna be different from the next pair, which is Greek, because you'll see no sewing and it's mostly just draping and pinning. So as you can see, really tiny waist, I'm jealous. <laughs> really tiny, tiny waist. Um, so not just for the women, but also for the men. So this is the priest king of Knossos, uh, again, Crete circa 1540 to 1450. And look at that elaborate headdress, really interesting. This one happens to be black and white, but very elaborate in colors. And Project Runway did a very heavy influence uh, on it, so I had to show you that one. But this is one of the most, this is a Minoan snake goddess um, from the Palace of Knossos from Crete. It's very famous, this is the one you'll usually see in all the history books, okay? All right, so that covers part two of chapter one. Thank you for listening.